Hi everyone! In this video, we are going to learn what is Rust and its architectural constraints. Let's begin. Rust stands for Representational State Transfer. It is a software architectural style that was created to guide the design and development of the architecture for the remotely distributed systems, which includes web APIs, on the World Wide Web. Even this definition shows that information is related to the developers more than testers. But we will need to know some basic knowledge. The developers will need to dive much deeper as those will need to build APIs. What is relevant for us testers is to know that REST is a software architectural style for the development of the software products on the Internet. And the key rules of the REST architectural style are REST constraints. And there are six of them. Client server architecture, statelessness, cacheability, use of a layered system using a uniform interface, and support for code on demand. If the system or API is built according to these principles, it's classified as RESTful. And we need to get familiar with each of them to understand what the REST API is. Let's start with the client-server architecture. The client-server model is a distributed application structure between the providers of a resource of service, called servers, and service requesters, called clients, separating the user interface concerns from the data storage concerns. As usual, the definition is intense. Let's talk about it in a simple way. The providers of a resource or service called servers. This means that there is a server, a powerful computer, which has some data, like as the Google Maps server, which stores data, maps, coffee shops, everything. They have the data, and there are other systems on the Internet web which need the data, called clients. And those clients are me and you, the end users. Not we as humans, but the applications like browsers or apps on our phones. Each time when you search for the coffee shop in the Google Maps app, the app sends the question to the request to the server because maps and coffee shops are stored there. That's why clients are server requesters. They need a service. In our case, find the closest coffee shop. And the server finds the answer to your requests and sends the coffee shop location back. Provides a resource or service to the client as in the definition. This is a very light explanation of the theory, but for now we are not going to dive deeper into details of each principle. We'll have a separate video about each of them further in the course. Let's move to the next architecture constraint. Statelessness. A stateless communication in which no session information is retained by the receiver, usually a server. As usual, this definition sounds complex. Let's get back to our schema. Again, we have a client app, let's say browser in the phone, and we have the Google server, which stores the Las Vegas map. Let's imagine the scenario. You, the end user, need a Las Vegas map, so you open the browser and search for Las Vegas. The browser asks the servers for the map. The server reaches in the catalog and finds the map, and provides the map to the browser. Then. Let's say it is 2 a.m. in the morning, and you realize you have nowhere to stay. You open the browser again, and the browser sends the new question to the server. I need a place to sleep. But the server is confused. The server is polite and asks a question. Where are you? The client is confused as well. He thought that the server is a friend, and tried to push on the server's feelings and asks to recall that they talked yesterday. But the server is not a friend. The server is a REST server. It leads us back to the definition, no session information is retained by the receiver, usually a server. The server forgets everything the second when it sends the answer to the question. It doesn't remember the client or the data they shared. The client has no choice but sends the appropriate question. As it is said in the definition, relevancation data is sent to the receiver by the client in such a way that every packet of information transferred can be understood in isolation, without context information from previous packets in the session. 
so client specifies the location again. This one server understands because it has all information needed and send the hotels in Las Vegas to the client. If client will send a request in not RESTful format again, then RESTful server will ignore it because it forgot the client at the moment server sent the hotels to the client. So stateless communication is a very simple independent question answer sequence. The client asks a question and the server answers it appropriately. The client will ask another question. The server will not remember the previous question answer scenario and will need to answer the new question independently. I think for now this one is clear. We'll talk about it in deep in the future. Let's move to the next principle. The Cacheability Principle On the World Wide Web, clients can cache responses. Responses must define themselves as either cacheable or non-cacheable to prevent clients from providing stale or inappropriate data in response to further requests. Let's move to the client-server schema to explain this. Everything is usual, clients, server, map resource. The client sends a request to the server. Hi, I just moved to LA and I need a new map. The server finds the map in the database and sends it back to the client. Additionally, the server informs the client that the map is huge and if the client will ask about it each time when a user opens the map, the user will need to wait. And how long to wait depends on the download speed on the client side. This is related to the definition, responses mod themselves as either cacheable or non-cacheable. And server inform the client the client can cache the data and the response is cacheable. This kind of data like site logos, images and maps is the best candidate to be cached and stored on the client site. The clients decide to store the map. And what does it mean for you as the end user? It's that each time when you will open the Google Maps app on your phone, the app will not send any request to the server. It will take a map from your phone because it will be saved there. That is why some applications take up so much space on your phone. And if you clear the cache, then you can see that everything loads much slower. Because if you deleted the map on your phone, now it needs to download a new map from the server. Anyway, every time when you open the Google map, the LA map is taken not from the Google server, but from your phone, where it is saved. There is one issue with this flow. What is there will be a new coffee shop? Let's say someone opened a new coffee shop 200 meters from your house. The data about the coffee shop exists at the server database. And if the map is taken from the phone, you won't be able to see the new coffee shop because it is not there. The server has a lot of updates every day. Because of it, the client should implement a mechanism once at some period of time to check for the updates. Let's say once per day client will ask the server if there are some updates to the map. And if there are some updates, let's say a new coffee shop is opened. Then the client will download those and update the cache with the newest data. It's up to the client to decide how often he wants updates. So again, cacheability means that if you already asked about some data and saved it on the client side, next time when you open the app, client will show data from the cache instead of asking the server. And it can be thousands of times faster. Just do not forget to update the cache time after time. I think this constraint is clear now. Let's move to the next one. The layered system constraint. A client cannot ordinarily tell whether it is connected directly to the end server or to an intermediary along the way. It is straightforward, but as usual, Let's check the schema. And as usual, the client asks for a coffee shop in LA. I know that I could provide a different example than a coffee shop, but I like consistency. And you will see this example a lot of times in the future. My advice is simple, be patient. So our request goes to the server and we have no idea what happens next. In reality, the LA map can be stored in one server. 
and coffee shops, data, names, images and coordinates can live on a third server. And the server which we asked for the map with coffee shops on its side can ask those servers for the data. Then, once data is on its side, the server can process it and send back to us the response with the map and coffee shops on it. And the client has no idea about everything that happened on the server side, exactly what is mentioned in the definition. A client cannot ordinarily tell whether it is connected directly to the end server or to an intermediary along the way. We have two more constraints. Let's move on. The next constraint is code on demand. Servers can temporarily extend or customize the functionality of a client by transferring executable code. To be honest, I haven't found example of it in Google API or other public APIs, so for now we are going to skip the detailed explanation. I will try to find something in the future and will create a separate video. In general, the server sends some code and some logic to the client side. And client executes the script, displays the valid data to the user, or sends appropriate data to the server. Anyway, this constraint is optional and self-explained. Server will send some code which brother or app will execute. Let's move to the last constraint. And the last one is a big one. The uniform interface. It simplifies and decouples the architecture, which enables each part to evolve independently. And it has four additional constraints. But we are not going to learn those for now. In simple words, there are client and server, two separate independent unrelated systems. And they need a link between them. And because of that, they have a uniform interface. In our case, it is an HTTP web layer with key verbs to work with resources on the server. And we are going to talk about it in details in one of the next videos. Let's summarize what we have learned in this video. First of all, we got familiar with the REST definition, and we learned that REST stands for Representational State Transfer, and that it is a software architectural style for web development. And the core of the REST is six architectural constraints. Client-server architecture, statelessness, cacheability, use of a layered system, using a uniform interface, and support for code on demand. All six principles are important, and we will have a separate video for each of them in the future. But to be able to start testing the REST APIs, there are two constraints that are essential to know. The client-server architecture and uniform interface. Because of this, we are going to dive deeper into what stands behind those principles. And we are going to talk about the client-server architecture in the next video. Thank you for watching. If you like coffee or a coffee shop, leave a thumbs up, if not thumbs down. See you in the next video.